Good afternoon. On behalf of Swinburne and the Mandani Terminal Centre, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2020 Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture. My name is Professor Andrew Gunston. I'm the Executive Director of Reconciliation Strategy and Leadership and Executive Director of the Mandani Terminal Centre at Swinburne. I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners on the land on which Swinburne's campuses are located, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the continuing and unceded sovereignties of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. I also acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today, particularly my colleagues from Mandani Turnbull Centre and across Swinburne, my colleagues in the reconciliation movement and my colleagues in higher education. I also acknowledge Wurundjeri elder, Arnie Dye Kerr, OAM. Arnie Dye was going to deliver a welcome to country, but unfortunately there have been some IT issues and Arnie Dye is unable to join us today. It is though a great pleasure to introduce Professor Linda Christensen, AO, Vice Chancellor and President of Swinburne. Professor Christensen guides Swinburne's vision to be a world-class university, creating social and economic impact through science, technology and innovation. I would like to invite Professor Christensen to address us. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I would also like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we are gathered tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia and hope that the path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embraced. I would like to acknowledge some of our special guests who are joining us tonight. Mr. Ian Hamm, Chairperson of the First Nations Foundation and Chair of our Reconciliation Action Plan Steering Group. Ms. Da Diana David, CEO from Reconciliation Victoria, welcome. Ms. Karen Mundine, CEO Reconciliation Australia and Dr. Peggy O'Neill, President Richmond Football Club. Swinburne has a strong tradition of recognizing, valuing, and celebrating Indigenous heritage, knowledges, spirituality, and cultures. We have worked hard over the years to embed this into every aspect of our university and campus life. I feel especially honored to be part of this community. Despite the fact that we are physically apart, I'm glad that we can continue Swinburne's strong tradition and connect on this important occasion. Swinburne's vision for reconciliation is to create a university environment that builds on relationships based on knowledge sharing, mutual respect and understanding. We respect the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges and are committed to authentic recognition within teaching and learning and research. We are building a university culture that promotes and supports Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians to come together to learn and make a positive difference in the lives of individuals and communities. This can be achieved through collaboration and mutually beneficial research, teaching and learning activities and our engagement. Swinburne is a community leader in reconciliation, driven in large part by our passionate Mundani Tumadul Centre staff. Mundani Tumadul means embracing teaching and learning in the Wurundjeri language of the Wurundjeri people the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's Melbourne campuses are located. The centre was established in 2018 and is responsible for Indigenous matters at Swinburne, including our governance, culture, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and students, engagement, teaching, learning and research. Swinburne was the first Australian university to achieve elevate status for our second Re reconciliation action plan uh, between 2017 to 2019. This is the highest level of endorsement granted by Reconciliation Australia. Through our Elevate Wrap, we have embedded reconciliation in our practices and our decision making and encouraged others to do so in the process. Last year, we marked an important milestone in our reconciliation journey when we became one of 14 organisations to publicly support the Uluru Statement from the Heart which calls for First Nations peoples to have a voice in federal parliament. Through the Mundani Tumadul Centre, we are currently progressing our third wrap, 
and I am confident that in the year ahead, Swinburne will continue to be meaning will continue to meaningfully pave the way for reconciliation. The recent heartbreaking events in the United States related to the Black Lives Matter movement have spurred us to reflect more about more about the injustices in our own society. It's important to acknowledge and take corrective action on past and present day injustices as we seek a positive future for all Australians. As a university, we are driven to pursue innovation, seek understanding and share knowledge with others. As an Elevate RAP organization, we have a responsibility to amplify Indigenous leaders and the communities as the voices of change. Today, we come together to listen to Senator Patrick Dodson, the father of reconciliation, who will deliver our annual reconciliation lecture. Senator Dodson speaks in conversation with our own Professor Andrew Gunston, a unique opportunity in extraordinary times. I look forward to hearing Senator Dodson's reflections on the past 40 years of the reconciliation movement and his views on the current situation of Indigenous affairs in this country. Reconciliation is a shared responsibility, a shared journey, and I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I would like to thank you for leading Swinburne's journey of reconciliation. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're delighted we have over 800 registrations for this event. As we mentioned on the event page, this lecture was recorded last week due to parliamentary commitments. The format of the lecture is a conversation between the Senator and myself on a range of issues, including land rights, treaties, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, reconciliation and constitutional reform. I invite you now to listen to the 2020 Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture. Welcome everyone to the 2020 Annual Swinburne Reconciliation Lecture. I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the lands on which Swinburne's campuses are located and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching this and acknowledge the continuing and unceded sovereignties of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. In 2016, Swinburne created an annual reconciliation lecture designed to advance understandings in the wider community on reconciliation. The lecture is a key element of our Elevate Reconciliation Action Plan. It is a great pleasure I welcome and introduce our 2020 Reconciliation Lecture Speaker, Senator Patrick Dodson. Patrick is a Yarrow man from Broome in Western Australia. He has dedicated his life work to being an advocate for constructive relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples based on mutual respect, understanding and dialogue. Patrick has extensive experience in Aboriginal Affairs, previously as Director of the Central and Kimberley Land Councils and as a Commissioner in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. He also served as inaugural Chair of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, Co-Chair of the Expert Panel for Constitutional Recognition of Indigenous Australians and co-chair of the National Referendum Council. Since entering the parliament in 2016 as Senator of Western Australia and Shadow Assistant Minister for Reconciliation and Constitutional Recognition of Indigenous Australians, Patrick has fought for justice for First Nations people and a fair go for remote and regional Western Australia. We are honoured that Senator Dodson can participate in this conversation to mark the 2020 Annual Swinburne Reconciliation Lecture. Welcome Senator Dodson. As I mentioned in the introduction, you're a Yaru man from Broome in Western Australia. Can you tell me what Broome means to you? Well, firstly, let me acknowledge that I'm on uh, the country of other people and I acknowledge their ancestors and their leaders. And I uh, acknowledge the great uh, traditions uh, that they've um, that they will have and are continuing to uh, impress upon the nation uh, for recognition and agreement. Well, Broome is a, uh, a coastal town in the northwest. It's influenced uh, by the pearling industry initially, 
uh, and by the indentured labour system uh, by the pastoralists. So it had the pearlers on the one hand and the uh, pastoralists on the other, and, and virtually an enslaved, uh, an act that enslaved people to the pastoral leases. So that if they uh, the um, if they were to leave the properties, they could be captured, brought back, and flogged and made to um, to work basically for nothing. And similarly, in the pearling industry, people were made to dive, and women as well, even though they might have been pregnant, were made to dive to get the um, mother of pearl, which initially was used for for buttons in in Europe and other places. And gradually, the pearl uh, became a a, a, a a covetous item, and the, and the pearl meat, of course, today. So that background, and then the missionaries were the next big influence, I suppose. Uh, the Catholic missionaries who uh, set up missions up, up the peninsula from Broome at Beagle Bay, Lombardina, uh, and uh, around One Arm Point. So uh, the, the Yaru people that I belong to uh, primarily occupy a, an area of land that runs a little bit north from Broome and to the south of Broome, primarily along the coast. Uh, so we're coastal kind of people, very arid, not far from the desert. Mm. There's no rivers, uh, so you've got to know where the soaks are, where the, where the fresh water is, uh, and you've got to know how to find that even on the beaches. Uh, but we're, we're primarily a coastal people with some um, with some uh, uh, connection out into the Pindan country before you get to the desert. But Broome's home, it um, has many memories. Many of my family still live there. I live there, um, and it's um, it's it's a unique part of the country because of the, as I say, the pearling industry, which brought in Asians uh, from different places: China, uh, Japan, Malaysia, uh, the Timor, um, and so it's, it's a. I think the discrimination against the Asians and the Aboriginal people by the by the pearling masters mm. uh, helped cement a certain. Uh, certain relationship between people yeah. and uh, of course it was highly dominated by the uh, the West Australian 1905 Act which just gave the native protector huge powers to control uh, the lives and destinies of many people and in fact in my, in my case uh, you needed the permission of the native protector to marry my mother and father couldn't marry unless they had his protection or his permission mm. uh, to marry so and that was right up until the mid 60s really uh, prior to the 67 referendum but so it was a very much a colonial mentality and dominated by uh, authorities of one form or another uh, and slowly uh, i suppose rejoining the rest of australia uh, after after the second world war a, a lot more because the kind of english that people spoke in broome was a classified language. It was, during the Second World War, the, the Americans classified it as a suspect language because it was a pigeon mm. that was used in the pearling industry. Um, and so they thought there was some form of secret communication between uh, the Aboriginal people and the Japanese. Mm. And of course, there had been intermarriage and many of the Japanese fathers were indentured down to Kara and other places uh, during the war. So. It had that um, that influence of uh, being a unique area, but also being subject to the white Australian policy in a very dramatic way. And then obviously the impact of not only kids being brought to Broome uh, uh, in the taking the children away, but also the impact upon Asian fathers, mm. uh, particularly on Christian Asian fathers. So it's, it's, it's had a, a fairly checkered history uh, and today it's uh, emerging as a tourist destination, of course, uh, in Australia and uh, uh, subject to the, the challenges we, we face contemporary. Um, you know, it's got, to, got a great future for tourism and economic opportunities. Yeah. Thanks. You spent your early years in Catherine in the Northern Territory and later in Hamilton, Victoria. Can you tell me about these early years and how they shaped you? Well, Catherine, we had to go to Catherine from, if you, the highway from the west comes out of Catherine in the Northern Territory. 
uh, unless you go down the Tanami Road, and that'll take you to Alice Springs. Mm. So Catherine was the uh, a railhead for for cattle uh, for overseas, uh, servicing mainly the vesting market, mm. um, and it had a big public works department there for uh, road works, which is a Commonwealth, um, uh, I suppose, a Commonwealth en entity that in those days. Uh, so the, the Americans had built the railway line from further south of Catherine in the Second World War to take um, uh, goods up to up to Darwin. So after the Second World War, all of these old steam engines had to be cut down and the Japanese came and cut them down and mm -hmm. took them back to Japan, of course. But Catherine was, in, I learnt in Catherine because of good, uh, good headmasters. It was a primary school dominated by a, a headmaster um, and both the, the headmasters that I had were very, very fair. They were very uh, just. And when some of the townspeople didn't want Aboriginal kids coming to the picnics or to the parties because we couldn't afford to bring anything, uh, he would insist that we came mm. and that there was, there was a sense of equality and fairness. Uh, didn't stop him from giving us the strap, though, when we, uh, when we ran away and rode horses mm. and we were, were not at school. But I also learned that education was a very important thing. Uh, our curriculum was still dominated by South Australia in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no boarding schools in the Territory. And so, the, when I, and I lost my parents in the last years of primary school. And so, um, uh, that's how I come to be sent to, to Victoria, mm -hmm. to, to Hamilton. Um, and I had no idea where Hamilton was, of course. Um, and a lot of, there'd been a few kids sent to different places, some in New South Wales, some into Queensland. And uh, so, well, Victoria's, if you're going to go away, you must go to the furthest point possible. Uh, unbeknowing to me how cold it was and uh, how far away it really, really was. And, and, uh, but Hamilton, uh, I, I, uh, it was a boarding school, all boys in those days, and run by a religious order, the Missionary Sacred Heart. Um, the brothers did most of the hard work. They had to cook and do the washing and clean the grounds, all of those sorts of things. The priest. Uh, were the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, so there I learnt the value of study um, and the importance of, uh, of public speaking mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and also that um, education was a, a really valuable resource and needed to be um, used to help others, uh, particularly other people who didn't have the opportunity of going to school. This was prior to the um, to the grants, uh, ab-study grants, as they were called later. Uh, so uh, during the during the holidays, I couldn't go back to the north. I used to go out to a farm and uh, around Caston, uh, up near Harrow, and work for a bit of pocket money uh, on the farm, whether it's rabbiting or chasing the sheep or cattle or doing other jobs, um, as uh, you know, hay carting in the in the summertime. So. Um, and that was good because I formed a relationship with a very, uh, very, very good family that uh, I'm still very close to today. The, the old people have passed away, mm -hmm. uh, but that family looked after me and, um, and and showed me that you can collaborate mm -hmm. uh, and that not, not all white people are bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often talk about Mrs. Gartland's example of uh, when the welfare came to check on how I was going. And they'd written this rude letter to say whether there were sheets on the bed. And uh, of course, Mrs. Garden had been an ex matron of hospitals. And so they came over to the school, the college, when the, the uh, welfare bloke came up. And uh, she told me to stay outside. And, uh, and I never saw the welfare people again after that. So she, she made it very clear that uh, mm -hmm. Western District's farmer's wife was, was not going to let a little kid sleep out in the open or at the woody. So. No, and I, I made some good friends, which I've still got today mm -hmm. from the college. A strong loyalty amongst many of the the, the, the students that uh, were there. I became captain of the school, uh, captain of the footy team. Um, and, I, and I learnt that uh, leadership is a, is, a, is a challenging thing mm -hmm. and, and hard decisions have to be made sometime, but you need to be able to communicate as best you can for for what it is you want to lead people to. Mm. 
Mm. Mm. And, um, of course, the 67 referendum took place during the course of my time at Hamilton. And uh, the, the discussion around that uh, was quite interesting because most of the learnings at that time was we were a dying race and we were mm. going to disappear. Mm. And uh, there'd been some people from Framlingham that I used to see down the town and I always wondered every year whether they'd be there the next year because of this stupidity of mm. uh, deeming us to be a dying race. But it was an important place for study, a great discipline because it's a boarding school, mm. uh, and for learning how to get on with other, other people who are different and, and diverse, uh, and also to appreciate uh, the challenges that others have got as much as the challenges that uh, I had myself. But, uh, because we had some really rich kids come there. Mm. We saw how they squandered, uh, you know, the material goods that they had and which most of us never had. Uh, so we learned about uh, how you can be so indifferent because you're, you're well off and, and, you, and you can, because you can do it. Mm. Whereas the poor kids who struggle and, um, you know, try to make ends meet, we'd, we'd share things. Mm. Yeah. After working several years as the first Aboriginal priest, you left the priesthood to join the Central Land Council. During this time, you were involved with several land rights campaigns and the return of Billaroo Katajuda National Park to the traditional owners of the Anagu people. Uh, can you reflect on those times and discuss the importance of land for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Yes, well, I was the, uh, the, the um, director of the Central Land Council. Uh, which was a structure we had to build. Uh, when I was first employed at the Central Land Council, I came in as a uh, as head of the, the the field staff, the field officers, and um, and put in charge of the communications uh, section of the Land Council. Um, and of course, that led to many challenges with the Northern Territory government who ran racist political campaigns. But it also led to interfacing with the federal parliament whenever they wanted to capitulate to the mining companies or others to amend the Land Rights Act. Yeah. And so when it came to Uluru being handed back, we, it, was a, it was a challenging feature because the Land Rights Act goes to the border of the Northern Territory, so the southern border, yet the people there are busy Yarra people mm -hmm. and they have a, an affinity across three states, West Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory. And so trying to not only deal with the um, the obstruction that the Territory Government tried to uh, wreak upon it, but also had to explain to the uh, Pitjantjara people w why this uh, Uluru had to be leased back, for mm. instance, to, to a park authority, mm. and how that park authority should work, and um, and that there was still be access for tourists to, to come and go and all of those things. And um, we so, but we had a fairly good legal team, and we interacted with the Pitjantjara Council's team, which was uh, led by the late uh, Philip Toyne, uh, who was the, their principal lawyer at that time. But it meant that um, the, the territory government tried its best to create fear, and all of their political campaigns are always about creating fear that the Aboriginal people are going to do this or stop you from that or. Um, you know, got too much, too many advantages and whatever it was. Uh, so the Land Council's life was to defend the Act mm -hmm. and to assist people to get back onto their country, so they run claims, and then to negotiate with uh, third parties who wanted to access uh, land that was held by Aboriginal people, whether they're miners or developers, and to deal with some big projects like the railway project uh, from Ellis Springs to Darwin or the Marini uh, oil and gas project. Uh, but also then to look at how, how, how do we manage the potential benefits that were coming to the people um, so that it wasn't just money in the hand, as it were, but how did you create structures uh, mm. that could be that could set up to manage the monies mm. and help educate people uh, to the longer term potential of investments and things like that. And uh, at that time, Marcia Langton was working, Professor Langton was working with us. Uh, we had um, uh, Mr. Ross, who just retired from there. Uh, but we had some good legal people out of the Melbourne Bar, of course, that worked in the in the uh, Land Council. 
and we, we created a, uh, a thing which is called Centercorp, which was an economic uh, uh, trust company to give the broader Centralian Aboriginal population the opportunity to buy assets or to, or to get, get an economic base. So not only were we just doing the statutory functions of uh, getting land back for people, negotiating with third parties and then helping to develop the land use agreements, but we're also looking to the future on how uh, the uh, how, how uh, Central Australian people could have an economy or have a, uh, an income base from the benefits that were being derived out of their land mm. uh, and uh, and to some degree um, they've been very successful. So after I left there, they became mm. very successful in uh, capitalising on some of the assets that they've now got under management um, because of, of good, uh, good leadership and good governance that they've had. But the, Central Australia is a unique place. It, um, it uh, obviously had uh, a lot of the mystique of um, the late Charles Perkins because he came from there. Uh, uh, but it also had some very good leaders who were, were working in other organisations like the health service. It was a time when um, the um, uh, transfer from keeping your accounts on the back of a, you know, an envelope basically to, yeah. to databases on computers Mm -hmm. um, and where communication, uh, IT was starting to become a bigger feature. Um, but land claims was still very much about people, about stories, about song, about uh, history uh, and about the, um, the contemporary challenges that uh, came from the use of the land. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a, Central Australia is a very, very significant uh, area, as most people would say about the areas they worked in, but I, I was taught a lot by people from the desert. Mm -hmm. Very big areas of land. I mean, the Central Land Council area goes almost half of the Northern Territory. You go up to the Barclay Highway and then across to through Calcarini to the, to the Western Australian border. A lot of desert areas, big expanses of land. People have connections though through those areas. You know, the Walpuri people are a big people, the Majara, the Yaru, uh, Aranda. Um, and, and often the discussions around development became complex because of the connections of people outside of the areas being affected. Mm -hmm. um, so under the Land Rights Act, there are challenges at times. Uh, that uh, needed to be abided by that uh, some people may not have fully appreciated from a cultural perspective or a customer law perspective. Um, but it was, I think the, and there's a different history to Central Australia than to the top end, because the, the Northern Land Council became very much under the influence of the bureaucrats in the setting of it, setting of it up, whereas Central Australia grew, grew out of the movement of people wanting to go back and live on their country. On, um, on excisions of, of the pastoral leases. Uh, and they'd been a more, I suppose, a more militant group of people in, in other areas like health and housing education. Uh, so a lot of a lot of uh, support for organisations like Tungandira Council, mm -hmm. Congress, um, the creation of the Yipperinja School, which was, you know, to teach people the language for kids who lived on the fringe camps. The whole notion of the French camps, which is a one of the first things that the land commissioner addressed himself to, was these these people who lived around the towns of uh, Alice Springs and other places, and how could they be given some form of title to get security so you could put put assets in there like water and power and those sorts of things. So the town camps of Alice Springs were were very important to the extent now that the town of Alice Springs is is pretty much contained mm. uh, by Aboriginal land. Um, mm. Mm. But it's um, a, a rich cultural place, um, and and uh, and obviously you know the art that comes out of the Central Australia is fantastic, mm -hmm. um, and the traditions, and they have connections across into Western Australia, of course, yeah. um, and down south towards uh, Port Augusta and places like that. Yeah, and and in general, um, can you explain um, <coughs> why why land is so important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait people? And um, how effective do you think land rights and then later native title have been in recognising that importance of land? Uh, I think land is, is such a critical component to people's sense of being. Mm. 
mm. and their sense of identity. Uh, you, no one in, in Central Australia would trade places with a saltwater person, for instance. And similarly, you wouldn't get that for a saltwater person. But we we enjoy each other's country when we when we're there. Um, but it's it's where your ground of being is, <laughs> your sense of who you are, where you come from, um, and and where your your destiny is tied to it to some degree because you'll return there mm -hmm. when you die. Um, and it's where you become most comfortable mm. um, because it's not just the material manifestations that are around you, the hills and the trees and the topography and um, even the towns, but there's a spiritual component uh, that underpins that that goes to, I suppose, the emotional sides of your life and the, and the sense of worth and value and your self-esteem. So land is connected to all of those things or is the foundation for all of those things. And when you cut off from that, mm. uh, you can see quite easily how, how uh, lost people become, mm. how despairing they become of uh, their existence and their self-esteem uh, dwindles away. And we, we see that with some of the, you know, the silent generations people who had a terrible life and being taken away and taken out of uh, family and taken away from country and they were trying to, some of them were fortunate enough to reunite, um, but there's always a big um, a big gap sometimes in the in the way that that takes place. So uh, it can be bridged and it will be bridged by, you know, people living on their country again. But it heals you, the, the land heals you as well. Um, and people will often just want to get out of the town or, you know, get out into the space uh, where they feel comfortable. And I, I see with old people now in Broome who just like to go for a, a ride, I suppose, around the town as it's developing and changing and being impacted and go and look at um, places where they used to visit as kids and hunted and fished or camped, which are now being taken up with you know, other kinds of development. So mm -hmm. the, the, that connection, even though there's structures put over the land, there's still a a strong um, empathy with with that with the country, and people get sad when they see it being destroyed or abused or or rubbished, um, and that's why you have land councils and other entities to uh, intervene and uh, try and uphold the rights of people. Mm. And then, thankfully, we've seen some good things with the um, the High Court decision in Timber Creek. You know, where the connection, spiritual connection, has got a got a real value. Mm. It's mm. not just to be not just to be pushed aside. Mm. Yeah. And so how effective do you think native title land, land rights have been overall in in um, recognising that importance of protecting um, land? Well, I think land rights, obviously, there are the two different laws in the Western sense, and the land rights um, burden of proof is a very onerous one. It's very, mm. very um, much about traditional owners, traditional knowledge mm. and traditional responsibilities and connectivity to land in, in very manifest ways, mm -hmm. whereas native title has a uh, has a broader base mm -hmm. uh, going to uh, people's descent um, from that country, the association with the country, linking ancestors back uh, to those places and having sustained some of their traditions as best they could in, uh, against the oppression or the, um, you know, the uh, the socialisation processes that try mm. to wipe all of that out. And it's more about a, a broader collective uh, group of people. Mm. Uh, but both, I think the I think it's important that the, the Native Title Act enabled many other people to get, a, get their lands back and access to it. Mm -hmm. There are several things about the Native Title Act as such which worry me, of course, and that's the extinguishment principle. I think that's a very, that's an aberration to the, uh, to what could have been our, uh, the political goodwill of this nation. Mm. Uh, but that's, that's a creep back, that's a creep back to terra nullius. That's trying mm. to extinguish the native title and put terra nullius back in charge of the land tenure system. Mm. And when you make uh, extinguishment part of agreement making, then that's really uh, an obnoxious concept to me, mm. uh, because why should people have to uh, um, relinquish their native title rights, having had to, you know, assert that right, and then having 
get it um, recognised either through litigation or consent, uh, and then only to find that it's it's extinguished by uh, an agreement that gives you access to something that you you should have had access yeah. to anyway. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so native titles got some downsides to it that the Land Rights Act doesn't have, yeah. and um, the the um, both have got a communal ownership. You can lease and leverage those those lands. Um, there is a collective, um, uh, I suppose, return for for people. <laughs> Some people see that as a detriment, but I'm not necessarily of that view. Mm. I think I think there's you can accommodate individuals' aspirations to set up businesses and have their own own own, uh, own uh, home ownership and and other things, but. Um, <laughs> I do worry that when we look at uh, other social issues like the number of kids in out of home care, mm -hmm. the incarceration rates, mm -hmm. uh, the appalling um, um, domestic violence situations, that a lot of these great gains against the Crown become, uh, we, we become at risk of losing those gains because of the, uh, the, I suppose, the strength of our societies are being undermined. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when, and the other aspect of this that worries me is the, the destruction of sites mm -hmm. and particularly in recent days we've seen this, uh, this matter in the Pilbara where yeah. the, the ancient caves uh, and they're not just caves because they, they had an, there's an ancient hair belt yeah. that was in that cave they're, at Dularoo, not at Dularoo, at, uh, at uh, Barunga when Hawke came out and talked about a treaty at Barunga yeah. There's a group of the desert people that I danced with with a hair belt, and mm. that belt travels all through the desert. Yeah. And there's an, a, a, and that was many 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 years old, you know, to be using then. Um, so it's a significant part of the ceremonial behaviour, um, and the cave is a repository for that. Mm. Um, and now to lose that is is uh, the the belt's been secured somewhere, but to lose the the repository of thousands of years of heritage is just just absolutely an indictment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a real serious indictment. And and you know the we we want to, we know from the Uluru statement, people want truth telling, mm -hmm. and that's the truth about. The Aboriginal story, not just the Aboriginal non-Aboriginal story, which is a reconciliation component, yeah. but there's got to be the truth about the Aboriginal story. Yeah. How thousands of years of contact and the nature of our societies and the um, social and cultural uh, protocols that we constructed, mm -hmm. and some of us still live by those today in the songs and ceremonies, etc. And that has to be understood by Australians. It's, there is an intelligibility to this land that comes from a particular cultural perspective, yeah. and uh, it's, not, it's not just about the, the settlement history or the um, you know the colonial history. There's a unique First Nations history. So you destroy the sites, yeah. and and you and, and, and artifacts and uh, restrict the uh, uh, return of those things to First Nations peoples. It's uh, it's really an indictment on on the, the nature of our society when that happens. But it goes towards, you know, this um, obliteration of the memory mm. of who who the first owners of this land was. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned um, Barunga um, and when um, former Prime Minister Hawke publicly committed to a treaty um, following presentation of the Barunga Statement. And uh, Bob Hawke's uh, quote at the time was, we would expect and hope and work for the conclusion of such a treaty before the end of the life of this parliament. This, of course, as we know, did not occur by the end of that term in 1990. And now, 20 years later, Australia remains the only former British colony not to have a treaty with Indigenous peoples. And so why did the political focus at the time shift from land rights to a treaty? And why did the Hawke government not develop a treaty? Well, firstly, the opposition of the day. It was, I think, Howard and Hewson mm -hmm. were the opposition powers, and they threatened Hawke that if there was any legislation setting up a treaty, they'd tear it down the next day, basically. Mm. And so, out of that, he he realised that the Australian public also has to come on board yeah. with, with this, and that's how the Reconciliation Council came to be set up, really, because 
uh, a 10 year period of trying to educate the Australian public of the merits uh, of a, a treaty and what might be contained within a treaty. Um, and of course, that that 10 years went and, 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 and is gone as well. Mm. Um, so the land rights movement, I think it became, started to, people started to realise, and Eddie Marbo's contribution to this is significant as well, because he, uh, he was arguing for a native title, which uh, wasn't clear to, to many people what, what the essence of what he was saying, that there was a sovereignty mm. component mm. Uh, underlying our position as Aboriginal people. Um, and a, 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 and that, that sovereign position has never been resolved. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly the way in which the lands have been taken from us and the policies perpetrated upon us were never done with our consent or our agreements. And so that there needed to be, to restore some of this, it was uh, the notion of a treaty was uh, seen as the best possible way. And then uh, they used, they started to use a term, uh, Makarata uh, in the NAC days, the National Aboriginal Congress days, which was to, which has got some differences, some subtle differences, because a Makarata is the settling of the, of the disagreement Mm. and becoming as one, basically, mm. whereas the treaty is remaining separate even after you've settled some of the, some mm. of the uh, concerns that you've had. Mm. Um, they've both got merits. Uh, and, and, and in the context of our, our current um, political structure, we've now got a multicultural society as well. Mm. So the Blues aren't just with the colonial Mm. Uh, you know, descendants. Mm. Uh, we've we've also got to look at our politic, our polity, uh, into the future. So, how do we become uh, truly independent as a nation? We we still have these ties to Britain, mm. Mm. Um, as we saw with you know um, Mr. Whitlam's dismissal. Mm. Um, so, and and a lot of that British tradition still dominates mm. the way we we operate and live. Uh, even with the, with the obnoxious notion of extinguishment as part of native title, for instance. Yes. So, the, the I think the maturity of people, and we were getting far more younger people being educated, uh, going through to tertiary level studies at universities, uh, into law or medicine or political science or or, or other subjects, and who were, who were well far more versed in the uh, activities of the, the the colonists and the settlers, then people who lived in the bush who just knew these people as as some kind of uh, oppressor that wasn't listening to them. Mm. They, they, they'd never been disposed or you know thrown off their lands. Mm. Uh, they'd been subjected to heinous treatment by some people, but fundamentally they were still living within their country and their in their lands. But people who had been thrown off and had to find a way back out of the poverty and the oppression and the learnings that they undertook through universities and and, uh, and, uh, and other other ways of the School of Hard Knocks, uh, began to uh, uh, demand a greater level of of uh, participation and control. And I suppose after the 67 referendum, we began to see the rise of um, Aboriginal controlled organisations, mm. legal mm. services, housing services, um, education services, etc., so that the notion of um, and, a, and a greater awareness of international mm. activities uh, with the uh, South African situation with apartheid and leadership of people like Steve Go and, and you know, black consciousness mm. and then the American leaders and the black uh, Panther movements and so and Martin Luther King. So these international movements became have become to be more influential in the way domestically we um, we sought to defend rights or to advance rights. Mm. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, the pinnacle point was probably something like an ATSIC as a political entity mm. Um, mm. that was created. And, and of course, once it started calling for a treaty, yeah. the, agreement, the yeah. government decided to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, um, in regards to a treaty, um, what are your thoughts on um, some of the current processes happening? Of course, we've got the treaty process underway in Victoria. Uh, that's a process that Swinburne University supports. 
uh, as well as treaty consultations happening in Queensland and Northern Territory. Um, what are your thoughts on those processes and where do you think we are today regarding um, a national treaty or, or, or some more state-based treaties? Well, I, I, I support the, uh, the, the treaty processes in, uh, in Victoria and, and the other places. Um, they, they obviously have their problems, uh, but those problems are insignificant compared to the days when we were deemed to be a dying race. Yeah. So it depends where you're starting from. Yeah. When, when the white fellows wouldn't even talk to you, yeah. wouldn't acknowledge that you had rights. Yeah. But now the governments are a bit more enlightened yeah. and some of the legal changes have um, forced them to have to deal. Uh, you know, the United uh, Nations Declaration on Indigenous People's Rights mm -hmm. uh, is one thing that we've yet to domesticate, put into our uh, domestic law. Uh, but we've signed up to a whole range of United Nations uh, covenants and declarations about the rights of people. Uh, and we've got to yet, you know, demonstrate that we can measure up to some of those standards in, in many areas. But in that becomes the realisation that the First Nations have got to also have justice. And part of that is through agreement making uh, and through um, coming to common ground on uh, how we can co coexist. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the uniqueness of whom we are. And so treaties that go towards um, a, a greater level of acknowledgement of the people and a greater capacity for people to, um, I suppose, liberate themselves mm -hmm. is, is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was always saddened when the South Australian Liberal government came in and stopped uh, yeah. the marvellous work that was going on there with the... With the uh, uh, people and uh, with the with, under the leadership of Kai Ma and other people that was, that was happening, but you know, national a national treaty has got to deal with with national imp imposts upon us. Mm. Uh, we've seen court cases go to the to the High Court or to um, you take the you know the Stolen Generations matter. They went to the High Court to try and establish a peculiar relationship, a fiduciary relationship of the Crown to Aboriginal people. And of course, the court found that there was no particular you know, relationship. Um, and, the, and the sustaining of the, of the achievements of native title, they're not, they're not put beyond the legislative capacity to destroy those things. Mm -hmm. So we've got, to, um, we've got to have a national agreement about how these advances and, and achievements and other things that we want to see um, can be, <laughs> you know, if they're going to if they're going to impact us, then we need to be able to have a have a legal binding uh, arrangement with the crown to say, well, no, this is what has to happen here. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. just can't unilaterally decide. Mm -hmm. you, you're going to <laughs> impose upon us some change because you want to perpetrate that upon us, you yeah. really need our consent about this. And, we, and this is the process by which we have to give you consent. So mm -hmm. let's get down that path, you know. Yeah. So it's a learning curve for the, uh, the um, descendants of the colonists that they have to learn that uh, because they've got power and, they, and they've got a capacity to discriminate mm -hmm. uh, and subjugate people like First Nations, uh, then they, they've got to stop that. Because that's 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 what racism is. It's that capacity to subjugate other people, because you got the you got the power to do it. Yeah. Um, and then then we let's look at the the nature of our society and the status of First Nations within this country. So, uh, treaty making, agreement making is a very very critical uh, move. I, I think part of the maturity is slowly maturing. Unfortunately, we don't have the courage in the government at the moment to uh, go down that track but uh, the Labor Party is trying to get itself into a part in a position where it, it can become treaty ready if we get into power at the national level uh, we certainly support the Uluru statement uh, from the heart and the treaty truth um, um, voice um, uh, components and you know looking at the the notion of sovereignty that's within that uh, statement as well um, so I, I think we've moved a long way from when I was a, a lad. Mm. Um, I don't say we've got everything perfect because we still see the protests the other day about Black Deaths Matter. Right. And the thing that struck me about that was from a, because reconciliation, you try to find the common ground. Mm. Mm. You don't try and, 
and, and what's the common ground between the protests and the coronavirus is that you can't breathe. Mm. Yeah. So if you focus yeah. on you can't breathe yeah. and try and find the common elements around that, then I think it would be a far healthier discussion yeah. rather than trying to condemn people uh, because they went out and protest and, and took the risk, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they, they went because they, because the man was killed by the, the the police officer kneeling on his on his jugular. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he and he couldn't breathe. Yeah. You get you, the worst attacks of this coronavirus stops your breathing. Mm. You can't breathe. That's mm. why you need ventilators. Yeah. And if you can survive that, fine. But so there's a common there's a common base there for us to uh, reconciliation is about finding those common things and then working back out as far as you can where you can agree, then look at the things that you thought were, you know, of uh, you, you were disagreeing upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the, now the late Rick Farley was a very strong advocate of that yes. yeah. when he was in the Reconciliation Council. Yeah. And he and I went out to Fitzroy Crossing and the historic meeting between Aboriginal pastors and non-Aboriginal pastors. They're in a room and there's tension. And um, Rick uh, put the question to him, well, what do you like put in common? Yeah. And they immediately didn't find that they had the pastoral industry as the thing in common. But when they start talking about the pastoral industry, then they could see what needed to be done. Yeah. And yeah. then instead of the pastoralists, the white pastor saying, well, you've got your dogs and you come in and you make fires, then look at why these things are important mm -hmm. and why shutting gates, etc., are important rather than just, you know, start from an, uh, an argumentative point of view. So finding common ground and, and that's where people in power and privilege have got to start to understand they've got to find the common ground with the First Nations peoples yep. and go down these processes of treaty making and agreement making. Yeah, and that's a great story with Rick. Rick, of course, being the the past president of the um, or past director of the National Farmers Federation. Yeah, um, turning into what you, you talked about with deaths in custody, um, if we could talk about that for for a minute. Um, in 1991, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody released their final report, and this report is one of the most comprehensive analyses ever undertaken of the systemic institutional racism that permeates every area of our society. Um, as one of the five commissioners uh, on that report, and looking back today from the distance of, of three decades, um, what are your thoughts about the process undertaken by this Royal Commission and the final report? Well, I think the processes uh, that were undertaken, were there, there were two major uh, components to the process. One was virtually to rerun coronial inquiries, to look at what happened on the occasion that someone actually died in custody. Mm. What were the police doing? What were their obligations or the custodial officer? And, and hour by hour, what actually took place that uh, led to the death of that individual? The other component was what gives rise to people going into custody, coming to the attention of the police and then being put into custody? And so those two tension points, and if you recall the uh, Justice Muirhead, who was a single commissioner starting off the Royal Commission, um, and then Elliot Johnson became the uh, head of the commission. And it was Elliot Johnson who convinced Peter Dowding in Western Australia to appoint someone like me to look at the underlying issues yeah. in in the uh, in Western in the Western Australian situation. And out of that, the clear. Uh, and if anyone ever bothered to read my report, which is a separate uh, report uh, uh, from the main the main report, um, and, and I concluded with this notion of the policing imperative, that uh, there's always this police, you, you walk into a, you go into a little town and there are Aboriginal kids there, you'll see that the, super, the you know, the security blokes or the shoppers or the police uh, are focused on these young, young Aboriginal kids and then they'll put them under pressure about what they're doing in the in the in the in that public space. And of course, kids react to that. But the deaths in custody uh, was it was an opportunity for some very good minds to focus in on how to find solutions. I think mm -hmm. rather than how to find condemnation of of uh, mistreatment. Mm -hmm. um, not that they not that they steered away from the mistreatments. But to focus in on how to how structurally 
this policing interface and criminal justice interface could be transformed uh, both for the police and those people who work in that system mm. as well as for the first nations peoples and and so the duty of care the concept of a duty of care became is a very real uh, onus and uh, people who have the custody of another person have a high duty of care to look after that person because they're powerless mm. it's completely at the mercy of the person that has the authority and the power over their lives at that time mm. so it's a higher duty of care that they've got to uh, adhere to and and of course then the common uh, features uh, surrounding health of people taken into custody with, with, with precondition you know poor poor health conditions heart uh, kidneys lung um, diabetes uh, people prone to fits etc and and therefore you needed to police officers aren't trained mm. in that space and if there's a doubt it's a bit like this coronavirus mm. you know, if you've got a sniffle or a cough go and get yourself tested mm. well the coppers have got to take the, the attitude and the position if someone looks sick and is behaving and is sick take them to a hospital mm. take them to a clinic mm. take them to someone that's got the capacity to diagnose mm. what happens and we know sometimes they do that and they and they don't get the response from the medical persons mm. they then they have uh, preconceived ideas about the uh, individual as well mm. but there should be an onus on on the medical people to hold people um in in a medical situation for at least you know 24 hours mm. Mm. so that, uh, that their um, their symptoms can be monitored and, and uh, you know treated from a health perspective yeah. so if you need security at the door put security at the door but yeah. Treat people from a health perspective first, rather than as some, you know, terrorist criminal. Um, and that's that's the lesson that people should take from the Royal Commission. Yeah. And of course, since the Royal Commission concluded, there has been a doubling of the incarceration rates of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples from about 14 percent to a bit over 28 percent. Of course, a continuation of the tragedy of deaths in custody. Um, so you've talked a bit about um, about what authorities can do to. Um, to address the deaths in custody, um, wh what are your thoughts about um, about what what more can governments and authorities do uh, to ensure that this incarceration rate um, that's currently at the moment is uh, is heavily reduced? Well, look, they've, they've obviously got to pay attention to the 339 recommendations yeah. that were yeah. made by that commission, but they've also got to get behind now the leadership that's coming from the peak Aboriginal <laughs> organisations and and led by the medical service and Nacho and and but put the resources in there yeah. and don't keep treating this as a state commonwealth ping pong game yeah. you know? yeah. this is a national disaster it, 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 it's if you wanted to look at it from crude economic terms our competitors are going to use the continuing uh, rates of deaths and the continuing rates of incarceration mm. as, as, a, as something against our competitive edge in the marketplace mm. Yeah. Hardy did that to Keating, if you remember, yeah. uh, with the black deaths in custody. So, yeah. in a more competitive environment coming out of the coronavirus, this, these features are going to become, and the retraction from more, you know, from globalism to sort of nationalism, uh, the, the the health of a state, a nation state, has got to be very healthy in all its quarters, yeah. and that is Australia has the burden of not having solved these issues with First Nations people, and yeah. if the if the social indicators, the health and the housing, education uh, and the uh, training and skilling up of people isn't going to be uh, resourced and, and uh, yeah. innovative ways come to, to, to help deal with this and we just let it drift on and snap back to poverty, you know, uh, then uh, that'll be a great indictment upon us, let alone the misery yeah. we're going to cause to people. Yeah. So Australia's got a big, big obligation. Um, and when it comes to just to go back to the sites, the, the destruction of sites mm. is an international feature. Again, those multinational companies, uh, they get a social license to operate in this country and they shouldn't abuse it mm. for the sake of the, the marginal profits they want to make out of you know destroying a site in a particular area. Yeah. So yeah. we've got to take a lot more care as a nation with our with 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 their brand as it were with our but not to not to cover it up 
but to to restore and remediate um, and bring justice to those causes that we know lead to the inequity that First Nations peoples are in. Yep. Um, in 1991, uh, the then Keating government legislated a 10 year reconciliation process and created the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which you were the inaugural chair for six years. Throughout the reconciliation decade, many people defined reconciliation in different terms. You've referred to a false dichotomy between symbolic and practical reconciliation. So what does reconciliation mean to you personally and what should it mean to the nation? Well, I think personally it means the, the liberation and the capacity for Aboriginal people to, to exercise their own liberation within this nation. Mm -hmm. so to be free of the encumbrances uh, where we have to blame governments or we have to see the coppers as the problem or someone else as the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, to be on top of our own destiny um, and have respect in the, uh, in, in the society we live in in a manner that goes to the very essence, you go back to our connection to land, goes to our, yeah. our customary practices, our, um, our unique um, uh, social, uh, you know, protocols that we adopted through kinship and, and other things. So for, it, it's, it's going to be um, around a more egalitarian society mm -hmm. where the colour of your skin doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, this is Luther King and um, others have, have um, had better ways of putting these things. But it's it's, it's where we put the, the colour of our skins, the um, poverty or the richness of whom we are as a status thing to one side where we try to be, uh, we try to give life to this myth about everyone who gets a fair go in this country. Mm -hmm. We actually try to make that a reality. We try to visualize what a fair go is for everyone and then we try to practice our behavior our behavior towards those people mm. in order to enable them to experience the fair go mm. so when we that's what reconciliation is it's, it's about and it's of course it's about dealing with the substantive problems we've inherited by colonization and it's about treaty making and it's about um, compensation and all of those factors mm. as well but from a, an attitudinal level, mm. it's about us as, an, as a nation of people becoming closer, but based on the mutual respect for the uniqueness we're bringing to the table, yeah. rather than constantly trying to subjugate, uh, you know, one group of people because you've got the capacity to do it. Yeah. And, and that's what racism is. It's just the subjugation uh, to discriminate against someone else because you've got the capacity to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in May 1997, the Council organised the Australian Reconciliation Convention and in the opening ceremony, then Prime Minister John Howard stated, and I quote, Australians of this generation should not be required to accept guilt and blame for past actions and policies over which they had no control, end quote. This led to many delegates turning their backs on him. Uh, what are your thoughts about both Howard's speech and the broader issue of intergenerational responsibility and recognition? Well, I thought, his, I thought his speech was was appalling that day, quite frankly. And I can see why people, he, he, I think he felt I'd orchestrated that, but I didn't. People yeah. did that themselves. They got up in the, yeah. in where they sat and turned their backs on him because of the way he was yelling and screaming and thumping the rostrum and yeah. and, and making these outrageous statements. Um, the, the, look, there is intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. There is intergenerational um, um, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And there is intergenerational guilt, mm -hmm. and, and you've got to you've got to deal with those things. Yeah. Um, and and there, we, we're inter, intergenerationally we, we benefit, mm -hmm. so we collectively benefit from many of these things. So if you're a beneficiary from the exploitation of the wealth of these lands, that's connected to how the people who were here first were dispossessed. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've you've got to find a way to deal justly and honourably with the legacies of our history as much mm -hmm. as, as as anything else. It doesn't mean you have to uh, live constantly in a in a in a, uh, in a in a psychosis of guilt. Mm. But to get out of that, you can do transformative things. Yeah. Start yeah. To, start to tell the stories of truth, or start to listen to the truth of, uh, of uh, First Nations history and the truth of how colonists mm. took the land, and and the and the truth of uh, these doctrines of dispossession that have taken place 
and the need to uh, deal with the people who have been conquered by your activities. Mm. You know? So yeah. there's a real, there's a real um, uh, need for being honourable in the situations rather than dwelling in guilt or, or, or in, um, in um, a sense of shame. Yeah. Yeah, um, I remember being there um, at that convention. There were some amazing moments for me personally, but another key moment at that convention occurred right at the closing ceremony when you read out a call to the nation. And this stated reconciliation could only be achieved through a people's movement for reconciliation. And your speech directly results in the development of this people's movement that ended up with hundreds of local reconciliation groups across the country. And uh, of course, uh, many of these groups are still continuing today. So what today are your thoughts on the people's movement uh, and one of its key outcomes, the hundreds of thousands of people who walked for reconciliation in 2000? Well, I think we just got to keep on um, finding ways to better understand each other, uh, just finding better ways to commemorate um, the, the sad parts of our history. I was just out in South Australia recently at a, at a little town where people had been you know, forced over the cliff and into the sea. But they, they made a, they, they came together and made a plaque there to, to acknowledge what happened mm -hmm. and the community, both sides of communities there, um, recognise that. So uh, we, we just own up to the history, mm -hmm. commemorate it uh, and, and try to find common ground to celebrate it mm -hmm. um, and then to move on. Well, how, do we, how do we work together to enrich our, our lives and our positions as Australians rather than you know, how do we retreat back to the most nasty thing we can do to someone else? Yeah. Um, I think we, if we constantly try to find common ground and, and respect with others, then that comes from knowledge, it comes from learning, it comes from dialogue. Um, and dialogue, as you know, is different than just having a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. It's about scenarios. It's about, well, what would you like to see you? How would you like to see your society in 20 years' time? Yeah, uh, yeah, and try then to work towards achieving that, where no one's left behind and no one's treated as a, you know, as a, as a mendicant in in the process. So, um, egalitarianism is a high aspiration, um, but we've got to work at it and we've got to accommodate and we've got to change. And that's change on all sides. And we've yeah. got to forgive and we've got to learn how to love. Uh, yeah. You know, so they're easy words to say, but. You know, it's um, these are hard lessons that we've been taught by the Mandelas and by the Gandhis and by the Martin Luther Kings um, that, that uh, you know, uh, that there is a, a there's a, an essence of liberation mm. in true love mm. rather than one of exploitation. Yeah. Um, moving on to constitutional recognition. Uh, both the National Referendum Council, which you co-chaired, and the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which you've you've mentioned uh, in this discussion, have called for a voice to Parliament enshrined in the Constitution, a Makarata Commission, and a truth-telling process. The Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, which you also co-chaired, has endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart, as have hundreds of organisations throughout the country, including Swinburne. Uh, but despite this substantial report, in late 2019, the Morrison government announced a new process to develop options for a voice to government as opposed to a voice to parliament. And these terms of reference for this new process do not mention the Uluru Statement from the heart. So how would you describe our country's progression so far on this fundamental issue? And what would you like to see happen in the next few years? Well, uh, I think there's, there's a, you know, it's another, selective listening process that mm. the government's engaged in here it's quite clear what people have asked yeah. and, they've, and, they've, and they've asked the australian people to support them uh, to achieve these the modest very modest yeah. uh, requests um there's, there's no third chamber here mm. uh, people are asking for a voice to the parliament uh, which would be legislated mm. by the parliament so your powers functions purposes uh, and obligations, it would be ones that the parliament would legislate into existence. So uh, it's not as if you're setting up something separate and, and the interface with the parliament would be something that the parliament again would uh, would work out how best to do that. And there are ways to do that without fracturing the procedures and practices of, of the parliament. Um, 
and, and people wanting a, a constitutional entrenchment uh, is partly, you know, again, that's partly symbolic in a sense mm. because it's it's a head of power that the parliament mm. has mm. to use. Mm. If, you, if, if parliaments don't have to use powers in the constitution, but if it's in the constitution, at least there's some um, there's some recognition mm. that there's, there are there's these First Nation peoples and they should have a voice in the parliament. Mm. Uh, and so there's not this constant fighting yeah. about we need to be recognised and we need to have, you know, you, the parliament, take some note of what we've got to say on policies and practices you're going to perpetrate upon us. Now, the, this, the distinction between uh, where we're at at the moment and where we'd like to be or where people would like to be is, you know, you've got these... Uh, 60 people or so that are on three different committees that the minister set up to co-design, mm. I presume, the, the legislation uh, that would go towards how regional, local and national um, entities would interface with each other as well as the parliament. Um, but it's it'll be to the executive. Uh, now that's a shortfall from the parliament, mm. um, but it's, it's a point of principle. Mm. And I think... Um, the position that I would take is if First Nations believe that's what they can achieve and and that's all the government's being prepared to allow them to achieve, well, they live to fight it another day. Mm. And and we support that. At least you set up a structural mm. way. My concern has always been the, the need for place-based solutions mm. and regional autonomies so that the closer the problem uh, where you can deal with it, the better. Mm. Having... Groups of people just troop into Canberra believing they've got something important to do is, isn't necessarily the solution to things. Mm. But if you've got real power, real authority, uh, and real agreements with states, because you'll have to have agreements with states and territories, as well as with the federal government, on, on how to hold accountable um, mm. departments and, and the public sector outlays that are meant to be delivering mm. better outcomes, and you can do that at a regional level, great. Um, at the national level, you try to shape, I presume, how the nation can be better and more uh, more in integrated in itself and and how a, a treaty process might work or a Makarata process might mm. work and contribute mm. to the truth truth telling mm. process mm. Uh, and also deal with the, some of these, you know, woeful policies of uh, in the social welfare area, you know, mm. had, them, had them, modify those and make them a bit better yeah um so we, we won't we possibly won't see anything on the constitution under this under this in this parliamentary life uh we may see something by way of legislation or proposal uh, for a legislative uh, outcome by the end of the term of this this government um subject to what first nations people have got to say about the legislation mm -hmm. uh, it should get through uh, if they were supportive of it. Um, whether it meets all the aspirations, it will be another question. But um, I think my experience is that First Nation leaders are very, very pragmatic about mm. achievements in the political spaces, you know. Um, but it has to be. There's got to be a voice to the parliament, one yeah. way or another, because yeah. it's, we've seen that quite clearly uh, in recent days. Without an interface, a formal interface, uh, then the, the governments are lost. Yeah. They don't know how to deal, deal with us and they don't know where to go. Yeah. And we're just lucky that they've got some recognition of these uh, peak organisations today. But, you know, they, they can throw them out the window tomorrow if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've heard you discuss previously and also in this conversation here that, that fear is a big impediment to achieving reconciliation and constitutional recognition. Uh, we've seen this fear many times. As you mentioned, we've seen it with the inaccurate calls by some. The Illawarra State would create a third chamber. We also saw this with the hysteria over native title following the Mabo and Wick case of the Native Title Act. Um, so why does this fear exist in this nation and how do we address this fear or white fragility? Well, I think it's it's because people know, you know, it's, Australians aren't silly. Mm. They've, been, they've been confronted now as Bill Dean said in the in the in the Barbo judgment, with the darkest deeds of the past, they've had uh, umpteen inquiries, uh, whether they're royal commissions or inquiries into children or inquiries into suicide. Mm. Um, they're well versed with um, 
the dislocation from land that has happened. Uh, and, and there is a guilt. There is a sense of guilt. But there's also a sense that they've achieved a privileged position. Mm. And they're not sure, and they get frightened when they see the privileged position potentially being changed. Mm. Now, that's mm. the fear they've got to come over. Mm. Because what you, you, what First Nations people is, is not trying to remove that privilege from you, mm. but to get some equity in, mm. in the, in the mm. privileges mm. that you that we all should be enjoying. Yeah. Um, so fear is an irrational thing. Mm. And, it's, and it, it was worse when there was ignorance of uh, who our leaders were. So, you know, they've got to get to know who our leaders are in the past, what do they fight for, why are they still fighting for these things. And they've got to understand that uh, their own philosophies talk about equity, honour, mateship. Mm, mm. Well, they've got to live up to those. Yeah. And that's got to apply across the board. Mm. And fear, fear should be of the failure to create a united, a uni, united nation within our nation, yep. but one that has moved its goalposts a bit to accommodate the First Nations aspirations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Dodson, um, I, I'm conscious that we've gone way over time. I thank you so much for your extraordinary generosity in this um, in this discussion. So thank you so much for joining us today for the 2020 and Swimming Annual Reconciliation Lecture. Thank you so much for an inspiring, challenging and engaging discussion. We very much appreciate your time in speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. We greatly appreciate the generosity of Senator Dodson speaking with us and his wisdom in reflecting on such critical issues. It was personally a great privilege to interview him on so many critical topics. We will be sending Senator Dodson two gifts. The first is a Mandrook made by Bernard Atkinson, who will look at the cultural educator and owner of Winyar Dreaming Creations and also uh, an educator at the Koori Heritage Trust. And the second is a tie featuring Swinburne's rap artwork that was created by Arvid Peters, a Wurundjeri Tunurong artist. I would like to thank staff from Mundani Turnbull Centre, in particular Simone Hamlin, for their efforts in organising today's lecture. I would also like to thank Swinburne's audiovisual team for their support in organising the technical details of the lecture. And I'd also like to take time now to thank and acknowledge our Vice-Chancellor and President Linda Christensen AO. Professor Christensen is retiring in August this year after 11 years of leading Swinburne. During Professor Christensen's tenure, Swinburne has transformed its culture to one that genuinely recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander self-determination knowledges, including the creation of the Mundane Terminal Centre to lead these systemic changes. Professor Christensen has worked tirelessly to champion this institutional transformation across critical areas of leadership and governance, culture, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and students, engagement, teaching and learning and research. Professor Christensen, on behalf of the Mandani Terminal Centre and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff at Swinburne, I would like to present you with a gift to thank you so much for your leadership, your inspiration and support over so many years. Your gift is a bespoke piece from Lynn L. Young, a Gunai, Wiradjuri, Gunajamara and Yorta Yorta fashion designer and artist. I would like to acknowledge Vicky Peters for the initiative and the thought and for organising this gift. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I've got the gift here with me and I will open it now so people can say a beautiful, beautiful scarf, Indigenous art scarf. So. Thank you so much. I take great, great uh, joy in receiving such a special gift and I certainly will treasure it. I'd like to thank you, Andrew. I'd like to thank Vicki Peters, uh, all of my colleagues at the Mundan, um, Mundani Terminal Centre for tonight's lecture. Um, the Reconciliation Lecture is an event that has great meaning for me and tonight's interview was very powerful. Um, I look forward to listening to it again and again because there was so much wisdom and insight that um, that I will continue to learn from and reflect upon 
uh, and I'm very grateful to Senator Dodson for being so generous with his understandings uh, and his teachings. I am very grateful to have the opportunity here at Swinburne as we have created together to acknowledge our Indigenous heritages that we can learn from and, and build. Um, we have a responsibility, I believe, as a public university and as a thought leader in our community to foster learning and understanding as we work together toward truth and reconciliation. And truth is that first step. We need to be able to understand fully and completely um, the truths and the history uh, and the lessons so that we can take action and build a better and a kinder and more inclusive and loving community. So thank you all so much and thank you to my colleagues and for our wider community for joining us tonight in this rather unusual way. It means so much and uh, I will always treasure this part of my role. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And again, thank you so much for all your leadership over the years. Thank you to everyone for attending the 2020 Swinburne Annual Lecture. It's been a real honour to uh, have brought this to you and have a good afternoon. Thank you.